welcome to the Daily Space. My name is Annie Wilson, and most weekdays, the Cosmo Quest team is here putting science into your brain. Today, however, is for Rocket Roundup, and the whole team is here as we try some new things as we work to give you ever-improving content. This means you're going to get to hear from both me, I'm Pamela Gay, and from me, and I'm Beth Johnson. And together, we're going to bring you all the rocket launch goodness you're used to. Let's get to it, shall we? First up, on April 23rd at 9.49 UTC, SpaceX's Falcon 9 lifted Crew Dragon Endeavor into orbit on the SpaceX Crew 2 mission from Launch Complex 39 Alpha at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. On board were NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet, and JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshida. For those of you keeping score at home, this was the second flight for both Booster 1061 and Crew Dragon Endeavor. The booster landed safely on the barge, of course I still love you. Let's watch the launch. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Mission and lift off. Got speed Endeavor and crew two. Copy one alpha. Endeavor launches once again. Four astronauts from three countries on crew two now making their way to the one and only International Space Station. Vehicle is pitching down range. Nine Merlin engines on the first stage providing 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Hearing good calls on first stage performance so far. After a perfectly nominal launch, the crew set in for a 23 hour rendezvous sequence. The trip to the International Space Station wasn't quite as nominal as the launch. There was a small piece of debris, likely a piece of ice, according to NASA observed floating out of the Crew Dragon's trunk. This isn't great, but it has been observed before, and it's not a problem because an object coming from the Dragon itself is at a low velocity relative to the vehicle and wouldn't damage anything if it did hit the capsule. It was a more significant event during the rendezvous, a small chance of colliding with space debris. Astronauts trained for all sorts of scenarios, so the crew got back into their pressurized suits just in case. Fortunately, the object passed without incident. According to a NASA spokesperson after the event, the object was 45 kilometers away from the spacecraft, so it's pretty far away, and there was no risk of collision. In some happier news, in the rendezvous was the reveal of the Crew 2 zero G indicator. Continuing the Soyuz and shuttle tradition, astronauts riding on Crew Dragon, or rather their kids, chose a small toy to serve as a visual reference to when the crew is experiencing weightlessness. The toy chosen by the children of the Crew 2 astronauts was a small penguin named Gwyn Gwyn. Good luck getting one for yourself, though. Uh, yeah, you're not going to add this one to your zero-g indicator collection. As soon as the penguin was shown on the broadcast, it was immediately, immediately sold out. The crew finally docked to the International Docking Adapter 2 on the forward port of Node 2 at 9.08 UTC. After two hours of leak checks, the hatch on the Crew Dragon was opened, and the four astronauts came on board, bringing this total station crew temporarily up to 11. With that many people on board, it is a little cramped. Reminder, there are only six full sleep stations for 11 people. The current sleeping arrangements remind me of a slumber party. Find a spot and roll out your sleeping bag. The commanders of the two crew dragons sleep in their capsules and the remaining three crew members attach their sleeping bags to wherever they can find space. Literally, flat surface, Velcro, bag, boom. That's where you're sleeping. 
Anyways, this flight sees the number of crew members on the International Space Station stay at the level set by Crew 1, which increased it from 6 to 7 last year. This allows for more crew time spent on science rather than maintenance of the 23-year-old station. Specifically, the crew will continue the tissue on a chip investigation. According to NASA, the tissue chips are small models of human organs containing multiple cell types that behave much the same as they do in the body. The crew will also monitor the arrival of several uncrewed spacecraft, such as SpaceX's Cargo Dragon, Northrop Grumman's Cygnus, and the uncrewed test flight of Boeing's crewed Starliner spacecraft. Pesquet, Hoshida, Kimbrough, and MacArthur will conduct several spacewalks to install new solar panels on the space station that will arrive on SpaceX CRS-22 in July 2021. And just like how Crew-2 arrived before Crew-1 departed, Crew-2 will depart after Crew-3 arrives, which is currently scheduled for October 2021. Crew 1 will return to Earth as early as Friday, April 30th, so we should have a full report of that next week. After the break, we'll be back to take a look at some no humans required rocket launches. Stay tuned. On Sunday, April 25th at 22.14 UTC, Arian Space and its affiliate StarSim launched a Soyuz 2.1 Bravo frigate into cloudy skies from the Vostochny Cosmodrome in eastern Russia. Vostochny, which means east in Russian, is Russia's newest launch site, and so far, only eight rockets have launched from the site since its opening in 2016. On board the Soyuz were 36 satellites for the OneWeb 6 mission. This was the third launch of OneWeb satellites from Vostochny after OneWeb 4 mission in December 2020 and the OneWeb 5 mission in March 2021. Let's watch the launch. The live stream switched to an onboard camera just before booster separation and then switched to an animation. The rocket's frigate upper stage conducted several engine burns over the course of two and a half hours and then inserted the 36 satellites into the target orbit in nine sets of four. This marks 182 satellites launched of a planned constellation of 648 OneWeb satellites. Next up on Monday, April 26th at 2047 UTC, United Launch Alliance successfully launched the NROL-82 mission from Slick 6 at the Vandenberg Space Force Station in California. The launch was delayed one whole minute due to a collision on launch assessment, which means there was a chance of the ascending rocket hitting something already in orbit. That wasn't the case and all went well. Let's look at that slightly late launch that was instead completely successful. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy Rocket carrying the NROL-82 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. On the pitch over maneuver. The launch webcast started at around T minus 15 minutes and counted smoothly down to zero, and the rocket lifted into the air right at the beginning of the window, becoming only the third Delta IV Heavy to launch on its first attempt. 13 Delta IV Heavies have launched total. This rocket launches so little that it's not uncommon for there to be issues related to the rocket pad. 
faulty ground systems at Slick 37B, the Florida Delta IV pad, resulted in a dozen scrubs and four months of delays, August through November, in the NROL 44 launch campaign last year. To prevent a repeat of the long delay, ULA took a very close look at the launch pad systems at Slick 6 before this launch. The rocket featured its standard fireball on ignition, which looks scary from the ground, but is totally normal. It's caused by the buildup of excess hydrogen gas at the bottom of the rocket from the engine chill process, which results in a jet of flame shooting up almost the entire length of the first stage. It's so hot that the flame chars its foam insulation. Somewhat unusual for an NRO launch, a live rocket cam showed the California coast and the Pacific Ocean as the rocket headed to space. It is also, it also captured the side booster, core, second stage ignition, and fairing separation happening nominally. NROL-82 was a National Reconnaissance Office mission, so the precise nature of the payload and its orbit are classified. After fairing separation, the live broadcast concluded at the request of our customer, according to the ULA webcast host. Again, that customer was the National Reconnaissance Office. About an hour later, the United Launch Alliance confirmed on Twitter that the launch was a success. For our last launch of the week, on April 27th at 3.20 UTC, a Chinese Long March 6 rocket put a few small satellites into orbit from the Haiyuan Satellite Launch Center. Before we talk about the payloads, let's watch the launch. The Chinese Long March 6 is one of the new generation of Chinese rockets that use the higher performing and non-toxic RP-1 and liquid oxygen instead of the pretty but deadly unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetraoxide combination that the older Chinese rockets use. On board the three-stage vehicle were nine small payloads massing between 30 and 50 kilograms. That's between 15 2-liter soda bottles and 25 2-liter soda bottles. Among the payloads delivered to orbit were the Shell-1, a radar imaging satellite, Shell-4, an optical imaging satellite, four commercial imaging satellites, a technology demonstration satellite for real-time imaging, Tianche-9, an Internet of Things communication satellite, and Neo-1, a technology demonstration satellite that will do an asteroid survey from orbit. Since our last rocket roundup, the Ingenuity helicopter has made two more flights on Mars. For Ingenuity's second flight on April 22nd, the craft flew to five meters in altitude, two more meters than the first flight, and flew two meters sideways. The third flight on April 25th also hit the five meter altitude mark, but this time did it a bit faster, accelerating to two meters per second, which is the fastest it has ever flown, even in testing on Earth. Ingenuity also traveled 50 meters away from its takeoff point before returning. All of that took place in just 80 seconds. The fourth flight is expected to take place on Wednesday, April 28th. After the break, we'll be back with This Week in Rocket History. Stay tuned. This Week in Rocket History was honestly kind of boring, so instead of discussing nothing interesting, we're going to cheat and look back at yet another event that was packed into last week, specifically April 18th, 2018. At 2251 UTC, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, also known as TESS, launched atop the last new SpaceX Falcon 9 Block 4 rocket from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral in Florida. A quick aside about Block 4 versus the Block 5 boosters. 
The Block 4 boosters were plain white and lacked the improved thermal protection, that's insulation, and other components that improve reuse of the first stage compared to the Block 5 boosters that flew literally every mission after tests. Block 4 boosters were only capable of two flights, while Block 5 boosters have demonstrated nine flights, with more planned in the future. Anyways, back to tests. The first stage of the rocket that launched tests cut off and separated after two and a half minutes of flight and landed safely on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. The second stage continued to take the spacecraft to a highly elliptical initial orbit of 200 kilometers by, wait for it, 270,000 kilometers. Let's take a look at the launch. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff, the SpaceX Falcon 9 carrying Tess, a planet hunting spacecraft that will search for new worlds beyond our solar system. SpaceX Ascent commentary. Once again, we'll make call outs on the trajectory of the rocket. The status of stage range. Stage one propulsion nominal. And the SpaceX Falcon 9 has begun the pitch kick maneuver. This highly elliptical orbit allowed TESS to get close enough to the moon's orbit to get a gravitational assist from Earth's natural satellite, putting it in a two to one moon resonant orbit around the Earth, meaning that it would orbit the Earth once for every two moon orbits. The high eccentricity of the orbit also meant that TESS would, TESS would spend most of its time away from the Earth with a clear view in almost all directions. That clear view is really important because TESS needs to be able to observe as many nearby stars as possible. TESS is stargazing with a mission to try to find exoplanets around far-flung stars by using the transit method. When a planet passes between a star and an observer, also known as transits, the star will dip in brightness for a short period of time. TESS is able to keep track of where and when these brief periods of dim dimness occur by taking lots of pictures of the sky over time, which astronomers and other researchers are then able to compare to figure out which stars dimmed with a consistent pa pattern. TESS's first observation happened not to be an exoplanet, but rather comet C-2018N1, which was previously discovered by NASA's Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Project, or the NEOWISE mission, and should not be confused with comet C-2020F3 from last summer that was also known as Comet NEOWISE. Confirming once again, astronomers, that's me, we shouldn't be allowed to name anything. C2020N1 was spotted on July 25th, 2018 during a test of TESS's instruments to make sure that the craft could take stable periodic pictures of a broad region of the sky for a long period of time. The test also showed that TESS was apparently extremely good at detecting and identifying variable stars whose brightness changes and pulsates, which was a good indication of its ability to detect changes in eclipsed stars as well, aiding in the hunt for extrasolar planets. The first exoplanet TESS discovered was on September 18th, 2018, a super-Earth in the Pi Menzai system a system previously discovered to have a super Jupiter orbiting around its star. The newly discovered planet seems to be twice the size of the Earth, around five times. Sorry, I just realized I have a mistake. Um, the newly discovered planet, sorry, 
The newly discovered planet seems to be twice the size of the Earth, around five times the Earth mass, and orbits its host star once every 6.27 Earth days. TESS is still operational, having had its mission extended past its original planned span of two years. And as of writing this, it has discovered 2,647 exoplanet candidates, with 122 of those candidates confirmed. We look forward to seeing what the future holds for TESS, and we'll bring you key results as we learn them, right here at The Daily Space. For now, let's go to break, and when we come back, we'll look at spaceflight statistics for the year so far. To wrap things up, here's a running tally of a few spaceflight statistics for the current year. There are currently six toilets in space. Three are installed on the International Space Station, one on each of the two Crew Dragons, and one on the Soyuz. There have been 34 orbital launch attempts so far this year, including one failure. 797 satellites have been put into space from those launches. I keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. USA, 14. China, 10. Kazakhstan, 4. Russia, 3. New Zealand, 2. India, 1. Your random space fact for this week is that eight of the people in space right now were launched by the same rocket. Falcon 9 Booster B1061. And the total number of people in space? It's a very crowded International Space Station with, as we said earlier, 11 total crew. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX.